I'm so excited, I can tell you. Like, I went in the room yesterday and I was like, okay, we are going away. <laughs> like, this is big. So, super happy to have you here, guys, because I saw the room emptying up and I'm like, <gasps> there's, there's people, super great. Um, if I disappear, come and pick me up from the left side. I've planned to fall off the left side, okay? Now, guys, I'm gonna tell you in the next about 40 minutes, I've put a diagnosis together, and I've done this actually in the effort not just to vent, a partially is a venting presentation, but I've done that in the effort to really try and save you money, time, and nerves, no matter if you're a business who needs UX expertise, or you are a starter in our field and you're looking up to learn from someone. Because guess what, charlatans are everywhere. So, before we... Okay, maybe I need to turn it on. Help. What is a good presentation without a technical difficulty, right? Thank you. So guys, super quickly, the plan for the next 40 minutes, I'm going to really try to stick to the time so we'll get some break. I'm first going to tell you who the hell am I to put a diagnosis together. Then, guys, before we jump to the actual diagnosis, we are going to take a look at the market, a bit of the context. Then we are going in the diagnosis with its nine symptoms I'm going to show you in detail. And last but not least, I don't want to leave you here like, oh my gosh, it's full of charlatans. No. Luckily, in my big times career that Vitaly here mentioned, um, I've also met some great UX people. So I'm going to wrap it up by showing you what to look for when you are in a need of UX expertise. Sounds like a plan? You're with me? Cool. All right. Oh, come on. Okay, guys, so this has been pretty much me the past very, very many years. I've been like, oh! And the easy explanation for that, the superficial explanation is, I'm a Bulgarian. Unlike the British guys, unfortunately, we can't do that, keep counting. It's not in our nature. But that's the superficial explanation, right? When we start a little bit in the kind of in the history, how I've come to that, to be so angry, um, I did, guys, I do consider myself truly user-centered, because by now you know me as Martina Mitz. Good luck spelling or pronouncing my actual name correctly. And guys, if you are in testing, testing forms, fields, you're welcome. You want to use that name. So I started my career already. Vitaly already mentioned a little bit how old we are, but like I started really already last century, guys, as a self-taught web designer. And then in the beginning of this century, it took me like a year to gain the confidence to start acquire first small paid clients. And that actually helped me finance my life and study in Germany. And I finalized the latter, the study, the life obviously not yet, in Germany. Uh, in 2007, specializing as clinical psychologist, okay? And it didn't even take me a year, because the last years in my study, I fully concentrated on my profession, right? All these exams and diplomas and blah, blah. And I've completely neglected my passion. So it wasn't a surprise, guys, that I didn't even work a year as a clinical psychologist before I completely burned out, completely. And then I needed to take a step back, a step back, and actually be reminded of my passion, web design. So when I came back to the field a few years later, web designers were coding. And I was like, oh, wait, what happened here? This is like I'm code allergic. <laughs> but then, guys, I started hearing this user-centered design, UX design. And I was like, users, humans, humans, psychology, come to mama, yeah? 
Still, it took me a few years until I actually came to marry my passion and my profession. So since 2018, I started calling myself officially UX psychologist. Before that, I felt wrong as a psychologist, like everybody was these designers, and I'm the crazy psycho lady, yeah? But then in 2018, it actually started gaining traction, yeah? However, guys, since last year, I'm also a UX instructor. I know, boot camps, we're gonna say a word to that, okay? Enough about me. I told you, let's take a look at what's happening entirely on the market, get a bit of wider context before we jump into the diagnosis. So, for that, guys, I would like to invite you, let us first take the perspective of our potential employees, our colleagues. You're a small business owner, let's say, and you hear of all these great companies that do user-centered design and UX, and they disrupt the market, and you're like, oh my gosh, that's great. I have no idea what it is, but I need it. Yeah? And how are you supposed to find the right person? Yeah, you don't know anything about UX. You know you need it. How are you supposed to know who to trust the future of your business to? Guys, it, that's the beauty of our field, that we are so diverse. We've studied, like, I don't know any other field where we've studied so many different things, yeah? So diverse backgrounds. But hey, that's super confusing for our colleagues, for our employees. We all come, like, from different points of view. Hence, we have different approaches to our work. We use different methods. So how are our colleagues supposed to build a mental model of who the real expert is? And guys, unfortunately, when colleagues, employees are confused, what ends up is that UX is involved much too late in the process. Yeah, we always say like, guys, why didn't you talk to me a month or two ago? Why now? Mm. The second, guys, I would like to ask you, let us switch that perspective to ourselves. Let's look at our field. Imagine you are just trying to enter our field, and now you go and look at the job descriptions. UX, UI. So, to work UX, are you supposed to also be UI designer? Or UI, UX, so is UX a subset of UI? or product design, and now recently digital product design. So is UX just digital? And then last but not least, we always have these unicorn job bullshit descriptions there that ask you to, have, to know HTML, to do CSS, to do Python and JavaScript, and I don't know, yeah? So we are supposed to be some mythical creatures, some unicorns, yeah? Imagine you're just starting. You don't know what it is. You're about to learn and develop in the field. So you kind of trust all of that. It's kind of intimidating. You need to be something impossible, a unicorn to enter the field. So you kind of believe all of that. It really makes you like, oh my gosh, am I ever going to get there? And last but not least, guys, let's make it a bit more serious, yeah? I've brought you some numbers from Berlin, from the Berlin job market, because I live over half of my life there, so I had a better overview. And it's a tiny bit of a longitudinal study, so I did that in 2018, guys. I checked LinkedIn, because we do have Indeed and like Stepstone and all this, but the most representative for UX, even back then, was LinkedIn, pretty much. And I wrote UX, only as a keyword, in the Berlin area. Guys, 1,400 jobs in 2018. However, back then I forgot to use the filter only posted in the last month, which I did a month and a half ago. Guess what, guys? Before I used the filter for jobs posted in the past month, there were 4,500 results for UX in Berlin. It's, it sounds amazing, doesn't it? And then I was like, okay, this is going to half. It's like not all of them are current, recent jobs maybe opened. And then it's 3,000, almost 800. 
So it's more than double than four years ago. Like, what is happening here? Security. Yeah? This guy, like, seriously, this sounds, I was mind blown. I don't know about you. Yes, Berlin is a big market, but like 3,007, almost 800 jobs currently open in Berlin. So what are you guys doing here? We need you in Berlin, yeah? Then I was like, okay, no, wait. This is just like a few, yeah? This is not how we do UX or research. So I was like, let me check. Because our uh, German Federal Employment Agency uh, publishes the numbers every month. So back in 2018, I did that in the month that I checked LinkedIn, and it was 26,000, almost 500 jobs, guys, registered in the entire Berlin job market. So we are talking all sectors, yeah, from a cleaning person, construction accountant, doctor, everything that you can think of that's a legal job opening, yeah. And then, guys, also all kinds of jobs, because in Germany we have something that's called a mini-job. We have part-time jobs. These are not usually positions taken by UX people. And yet, guys, if we take a very conservative, just 1,000 positions, let's say in August 2018, it was just 1,000 actual openings, that would mean over 4% of the entire Berlin job market. And then I was like, wait, let me see what it looked like for April this year. Um, almost 4,000 jobs less. But remember, guys, we had 3,000, almost 500 openings. I went very conservative. I was like, let's say half of them are bullshit and are UI UX, yeah? And I was like, okay, let's just go with 2,000 for easy calculation. Guys, it's not representative, but I assume it's even more. 9% over, almost 10% over, 9% of the entire, imagine the pie, this is the Berlin job market. This thing goes to UX. I haven't searched for UI and dev. It's solely UX, guys. So I don't know about you, but I'm like, Okay, this is like absolute, I said years ago, it's like becoming a gold rush. Well, this is gold rush. Yeah, it's like UX is a very lucrative field for recruiters. Um, however, guys, that's the problem. When a field becomes that popular, it's super easy for quick fixers and kind of like charlatans to offer quick solutions. And we do have a saying in Bulgarian. After the rain come the mushrooms, like crazy. And this is what happened with all kinds of boot camps. So actually, guys, it took me four years to find the boot camp that I was like, yes, guys, I want to work with you. I'm totally on board. Because guess what? Many boot camps ask me to be on board. And then they're like, yeah, we do a mock-up project. We prepare the user research for the guys. They already work with it and they never, ever talk to clients. So it took me a few years to find the real bootcamp where we actually do real projects. So let's sum it up, guys. We have our very confused employees, colleagues, and they're like, yeah, UX makes sense, but kind of validate my ideas, tell me I'm good, and then we're done, yeah? Then we have all these starters in our field who are like, Guys, do I need to code? Do I maybe need to know all the design systems and all the design rules and guidelines and all of that? So it's intimidating. And last but not least, that's not, it's like a humongous, it's more than doubled the demand in four years, guys. So Corona has exponentially actually grown our field. Tell me any better criteria for the flourishing of imposters and charlatans, yeah? If you think of one, please really tell me afterwards if I've missed something. Now, guys, finally, we've come to what you've been waiting for. However, as with every clinical diagnosis, this one is a UX diagnosis, but as with every clinical diagnosis, you guys read the symptoms, sooner or later you think, oh, that's me. You find yourself in one or the other symptom. Wait. You've got to bear with me 
till the very end when I'm going to give you the criteria to apply and then you know you're most certainly working with a UX charlatan. Mm. So I think now I'll need more space maybe. Sorry, cameraman. Um, the first symptom, guys, only users are important. So UX is all about the users, yeah? These guys usually come from academia. So they love research. They get lost in research. They don't have much business experience. Hence, these guys will like really research to research people that, like they will ask them everything, but they don't necessarily generate valuable outcomes for the business. Yeah? Um, and then these guys also, and guys, I'm guilty of that, uh, will go that far to argue or even dismiss colleagues. Yeah? Oh, the business has no clue. Yeah? It's all about the users. I've even been there, I have to admit. Yeah? So, recently, a person like that checked one of my students' portfolios and said, why have you talked to the client at all? You need to start with user interviews. Right? So, who needs to talk to the business? You just go randomly research people, and then you find out something, and then it's good. You've done your work. <laughs> okay? So, a bit problematic here, guys, because all stakeholders, all our employees, all our colleagues, all people that use our expertise. Guess what? They're our users as well. So why do we treat them differently, I'll ask you, than our B2C or B2B customers? Or our end users? Why? They're the same users. Yeah, they're also humans. Also, guys, um, Let's admit it, like we all here be unemployed if it wasn't for the problems of these colleagues, stakeholders, yeah? Um, so instead of, okay, instead of saying something like, who needs stakeholder alignment? Like, why would you even talk to the business? Go out, research. You gotta first understand what problem space you are researching to know what to look for, where to look for it, what exactly to research, right? The second business, guys, is exactly the opposite. And we actually heard that yesterday in a few presentations. These are the guys that do everything that their boss says. Yeah? So the boss said it, of course I'm doing it. And these guys really love to do, 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 deliver, prove their work. They're like, they'll, they'll deliver these piles of papers to show you how much they've done. And what's really unfortunate is that these guys tend to care so much more about their state in the company, who they know, what their title is, how much they get paid. So, guys, I've been told a few times, Martina, don't take it that personally. It's just a job anyway, it's all about the money. Or these guys even go that far in usability tests to say, stupid users, they don't find the button. The users are stupid, yeah? The problem with that, guys, is that when you do that, you're in a reactive mode. You're just doing, yeah, whatever you're told. And that, unfortunately, not only does not help the business, more so, you actually manifest their mistakes. What they've done wrong all the time, you're doing it even wronger for them. You're kind of confirming them in their wrongness. Yeah? And guys, it's really a pity, because if you're in that reactive mode, you never come to enjoy or actually fall in love what we do. And it's something amazing that we do, because let's face it, guys, even if you work on a line of code or you manipulate a drop down or a button, with that you're affecting real people's lives. So how can it be just a job? Yeah? And maybe if something didn't work, it wasn't the users who were stupid, but it was our wrong decisions. It's okay, we're also just humans. Yeah? Now, gents in the audience, I'm sorry, guys, but this is Mr. Know-it-all. Usually it's a Mr., yeah? Walks in the audience, 
walks in the room and he's like, I know it, guys. I know, I have the snake oil. So this guy will make strong statements, really confident statements, and you hardly come to ask your question to the end. They'll shoot you with an answer because they know it already. Like they don't even need to understand your problem because they know it already. Yeah? And these guys might say something like, we gotta do a design sprint, is what Google and Airbnb are doing, yeah? We have to. The problem with that, Mr. Know-it-all, is that you cannot know it all. Simple as that. When you're in a big organization, you might be a super expert in your field, yet you won't be an expert in the other departments. So collaboration is key for our work. You need to bring everyone on board because you can't know it all. Also, guys, it's really important before we jump into doing anything, we should make sure it makes sense what we are about to do. Yeah? Mm. And I can't stress this often enough, but pretending to know it all, we're all grown-ups. So you kind of look hilarious in the eyes of others. Yeah, if you always say, I know it, I know it. Oh yeah, sure, I know that. Yeah? It just looks a bit like not credible. So why don't we start saying, hey, listen, I don't know that, but I know who to talk to. I know how to get on board. I know where to look for that information. It's fine. That makes you an expert. Yeah? So instead of saying the design sprint, that's what's going to solve our, all our problems. Let's see if it fits for our context, for our problems. Then, ladies in the audience, we're better at that. Miss We Talk. So Miss We Talk is a bit similar like Mr. Know-It-All, but she packs it all in fluff. It's like, hmm. So she also makes these strong statements. It's really, it sounds partially intimidating, but guess what, guys? There is no practical coverage behind it. If you think a step further, you catch her, actually, that is just things on the top, sprinkles. So she might say something like, I have over 15 years of experience in the digital area. As what? Serving the web? Buying on eBay? Okay. So, that's again a problem, right? Because to be convincing, you need to actually give real examples from your work, yeah? And these include not always the successes. These also include your fails, maybe a bit of bad stuff, struggles, because guess what? We learn most from fails and struggles. So why not share it? Yeah? And guys, let's face it, no one is our Instagram account yeah, and our Instagram profile. If you pretend to be your Instagram profile, well, we all others know that you're pretending. Yeah? So instead of saying something like 15 years of experience in the digital area, why not say I've worked as such and such, this is what I've gone through and from my experience, this is, guys, my learning. Much more credible. Yeah? Then the next one is the last verbally talented person, and we actually had it yesterday also on flight. The people who love their jargon. They love all these buzzwords, and it's like they love to always read the newest shit and kind of bombard you with it. And they'll hide behind it. They really love to kind of. And these guys concentrate so much on what is going to be done rather than why we even do it on the first place. Yeah? Because it's gonna be the design sprint. Yeah? They love these buzzwords, and even more so, guys, these guys feel really cool when they throw a few buzzwords at you and you're like question marks in your eyes, and they feel like, yeah, I made that, okay? So they might say something like, we need the heuristic evaluation to fill in just the MVP. Ooh. Uh, the problem with that, again, is that you need to work with others. So to make sure you're talking the same language, working on the same thing, first you need to align. 
You need to make sure you come from the same understanding. Then, guys, I said it before, it's important to understand why you are doing something before even jumping and doing anything. Yeah? And uh, when you get to that solution mode, it's much better to explain in human language what you mean, much more inclusive. You take the younger colleagues on board as well. So instead of saying heuristic evaluations and MVPs, and I can't tell you how many abbreviations I've heard for what MVP means, yeah? So instead of saying something like that, why don't, you, why don't we start speaking human language? We need to get an expert on board to review our minimal version before we release it. My mother will understand that, okay? Then, guys, the next symptom is someone who is not that verbally talented, but this person is very cognitively talented. So what they do is they pass the ball, the ball on you. Mm. They will make you do most of the tasks, most of the work. They love delegating to others. But they would also fish within you guys for all your knowledge, your ideas, your information. Yeah? So these guys um, will make you work for them. And because of that, they're really good to adapt at the current situation, what's happening, because you know it, and they feed from you. But they're not very visionary. And more so, if you guys thought Mr. Know-it-all can't say, I don't know, well, then look at these guys. So quite a few years back, I joined a company. I was a senior UX designer back then. After a while, I have the first wireframe concept ready for sign-off from my UX lead. And I meet her for the first time. On the second sentence, she says, she interrupts me and says, Martina, remind me again what a CTA is. Guys, don't get me wrong. I hate abbreviations, but like, call to action? Like, really? And you're my UX lead. I'm supposed to learn from you. That felt kind of like, ooh, okay. So, again, guys, I said it before, but like, really, let's start being human. Let's start saying, hey, listen, what, what, what is a, a CTA? Ah, yeah, call to action. Okay, I've called it something different. Fine, we're talking about the same thing. No one will fire you, because you don't know one abbreviation, okay? <laughs> and guys, if you want to take that charlatan, if you want to see if you have that symptom in front of you, just ask a few questions. Because usually these guys are asking you the questions, so just turn the game around. Now, I don't recommend it, but only if a person like that has sucked out your energy and you need to regain some psycho hygiene back, some energy, okay? And I wish, guys, I was that gangster back then. No, I wasn't. Of course, after the fact, I was like, why didn't I ask her back and see what she comes back for CTA? I guess that would have gotten fun, yeah? Now, the next one, the last three, we are coming to the final three, guys. The people who are in love with the tools. UX is all in the tools, yeah? These guys are in love with a certain software, I'm not gonna say which. Um, or they love one method, the design sprint, everything we can solve with the design sprint, yeah? And these guys also care a lot about what is going to be done and how, because they need to make it fit to their tool of choice, yeah? Or their method of choice. But they again don't care so much about why we are doing something. So, these guys also, like the second guy, if you remember, who does anything that the business tells them to do, the boss says, they also like to prove their works. Yeah, whatever they've done, they'll print it 100 times, send it to the whole organization, because you need to see how busy they've been. So these guys might say something like, we came up with the user personas, we thought of some users. Because who needs to talk to users? We are the users, or we know our users, yeah? And they'll be like, yeah, we just came up with the personas in Sketch. Oh, I'm like, my UX heart is bleeding. Let's validate them at least, and let's not call them personas then. Maybe prototypical personas, yeah? Um, and more so, 
these guys are like, I do wireframes. Of course, I'm a UX designer. Like, who needs to talk to users? I do wireframes. Yeah. Now, the problem with that, guys, is if you are in love with tools, it's not only 11 best prototyping, 14 must have 25. No, there's 100 plus. And you need to learn them all to pick your favorite. Good luck. Don't worry, guys. There is the UX2.co. I'm not going to experiment with the laser. You guys see what's happening here? They're going to keep track of UX design tools so you don't have to. But they start with UI design tools. Boo. Hey, at least they have the digital whiteboarding, meanwhile, in the category. So it's at least something. And I still don't see one of the most effective tools, guys, that has helped me in the past 10 years with great teams solve tremendous problems in complex systems, pen and paper. As easy as that. None of these comparison platforms tells you about the power of pen and paper. I know I'm old school. But it's a digital paper with an erasable pen, so not just as old school as you think. Now, guys, I remember I warned you. You'll find yourself in one or the other symptom, and I think this is the one where most of you will be like, Martina, what, UX is not digital? Well, it's the guys who are convinced that it's just digital. Yeah, so your experience starts on the homepage and ends on the checkout. Check. These guys, again, also love these tangible outputs, yeah? If you just learn something in the process, oh, that's wasted time. That meeting was a wasted time. You need to push pixels, okay? Um, and these guys are super comfortable to tell you, I just do the checkout process. That's my responsibility. That's where the user experience is. That's the most successful part of the user experience even, yeah? They're like, working on one touch point, one channel, and they're completely fine, because for them it's the most important one, okay? And these guys, more often than not, have studied HCI. Because guess what? It's already in the name of what they studied. Human computer. There is no other experience outside of that. It's human computer interaction. Yeah, in isolation. So guys, again, quite a few years back, meanwhile, I joined a company, and I was on the B2B side, business customers. And I couldn't talk to them straight away, yeah? So I was like, boss, I'm sorry, can I talk to the customer support guys? They'll know some of the problems. Can I talk to the sales guys? They'll know some of the motivations of my users, so I'll get at least some information. And my boss says, no, Martina, sorry, we're just responsible for the homepage. Uh, what? Okay, so, guys, I'm not sure if that's funny or if I should cry meanwhile, because this guy is still the head of UX of a company I'm not going to name, of course. And guess how he defines user experience? User experience, ladies and gentlemen, is obviously what the user sees. Obviously. So it's not what you feel, it's not your memories. Oh, and by the way, if you happen to be visually impaired, sorry, you're not having experiences, according to this guy. Okay? And now, guys, because I'm tired of explaining how UX cannot be just digital. You know what? I'll let the father of UX explain. The first person who called himself UX architect, Don Norman. Once upon a time, a very long time ago, I was at Apple. And you know, we said, the experience of using these computers is weak. Uh, the experience, when you first discover it, when you see it in the store, when you buy it, when you, ooh, 
can't fit it into the car. It's in this great big box. It doesn't fit into the car. And when you finally do get it home, you're opening the box up and, oh, it looks scary. I don't know if I dare put this computer together. All of that is user experience. It's everything that touches upon your experience with the product, and it may not even be near the product. It may be when you're telling somebody else about it. That's what we meant when we devised the term user experience and set up what we call the user experience architects office at Apple to try to enhance things. Now Apple was already pretty good, so we were starting with a good product making it even better. Today that term has been horribly misused. It's used by people to say, I'm a user experience designer, I design websites or I design apps, and they have no clues to what they're doing and they think the experience is that simple device, the website or the app or who knows what. No, it's everything. It's the way you experience the world, it's the way you experience your life, it's the way you experience the service. Or, yeah, an app or a, or a computer system. But it's a system, it's everything. Got it? Guys, if you disagree, you know I know it by heart already. I've watched it so many times. If you disagree, you know who to go to talk to. I haven't said it like he said it, okay? So, you guys see, it cannot be just digital. It is the entire ecosystem of your product, the way you service it, or when you don't have product, of the service you deliver. Okay, so you need to get others on board to be able to do your work. Yeah, you need to get your colleagues on board. You need to collaborate. You need to facilitate that half of our work is to bring others on board. Then guys, let's assume you've got that unicorn thing, the perfect app or the perfect website. Doesn't exist, but let's assume you've gotten it somehow. And the people from your customer support hang up. Or your sales guys are really rude on the door. Guess what? Your UX is going to be shit. Yeah, even with the perfect website. So instead of saying we're just responsible for the website here, like leave all the others away, why not realize we are all responsible in one company for the user experience? Even the cleaning person has actually impact on the end user experience. That doesn't mean everybody should do UX work, but we all are responsible, so we need to bring them on board. Um, and the last symptom, guys, are the guys who can do that too. Guess what? They've worked a little bit alongside someone, UX expert, and because the person was an expert, it looked easy what they're doing. Yeah, you're drawing a few rectangles and you color them, yeah? So these guys thought, ooh, I can do that too. And I'll explain you that it's best explained on examples, guys. It started, at least in my bubble, a bit more than 10 years ago with that UX, UI thing. Yeah, so many visual designers thought, I can draw these few rectangles and then color them. And guess what? If I put these three signs, UX slash, in front of my title, I earn 100, 200 more bucks a day. You can't blame them, yeah? However, so 2015, around 2015, I checked on LinkedIn, all people in the same list in my network. A UX UI designer who was previously UI UX designer. A UI UX designer who was whose skill is UX UI design. And there is also the UI UX designer brand and strategy and communication. Like, which one is it? These guys got confused of who they are, I think. Then, guys, we got the product design thing. Our colleagues, our bosses were confused. And they, in our companies that are entirely digital, don't have a single physical product, we had the product team. And now we designers had to be integrated in the product team. So, totally been there, guys. What did our bosses start in calling us? product designer, so we are part of the product team. And I was even a product experience designer, so you might think my goal was, my job was to ask the product how it felt after being used. Luckily, it wasn't. But like, product experience? Okay. So, if there are any industrial designers in the room, guys, I feel you. Yeah, I'm with you. Product design, guys, comes from industrial design. It really means the research and design of physical things, 
Okay? And now in the recent years, as well from academia as the business, are trying to expand the term to digital products. Ooh. Some of them call them services, but they try to incorporate business processes in the term product design. I'm not sure that will work, guys, so don't get on that bandwagon unless you design physical product or packaging or whatever, yeah? Um, and then my cherry on top. Again, quite a few years back, guys, I joined a company. Within two, three months, we are experience mapping. The whole research is on board. The marketing is like Martina. We needed you to kind of be informed in our messaging. And I'm like, how exciting is that? Really, in two, three months, we turned so much around in a very big company. And one of my closest allies was a marketing executive. And she must have thought, ooh, I can do that too. Because, guys, I went two weeks on a holiday, and when I came back, I was like, what have I done? It was such a toxic atmosphere from that girl, like I can't tell you. Um, she did everything possible that she gets my job. So I resigned really after two months, guys. I was looking at this theater, and I was like, this is not how I do my work. I resigned. I went away from the company. She got my job, and I'm a human. I went on LinkedIn and stalked her and thought to myself, oh, she shouldn't have UXX, UX experience. Like, why don't you put UXXXXX? <laughs> Guys, seriously, when you try to look for a UX expert, please clarify the actual X. Just because people write it five times, it actually makes it worse. Yeah? Um, and if you guys landed at such a toxic culture, remember, you don't do it for your colleagues. We do our work for our end users, for actual people. So even if it's a toxic culture, you're fed up completely, you want to leave. Please, guys, don't forget, it's really important that you leave solid structures and good handovers. So if a charlatan like that comes, she burned out in two months. She couldn't fill my shoes, ooh, because it was that easy. Or if a beginner comes who is eager, wants to do the right thing, but still doesn't know much, you give them a good fundament to start doing the right thing. So please, get pissed off at your colleagues, do some psycho hygiene, and then remember what we do it for. Yeah? And then as a dear friend of mine said a few years back in Berlin, guys, if you hear others stealing your language, your ideas, then you've won. You've done it the right way, yeah? So if we do the right thing, if we do good things for people's lives, it doesn't matter who I, whose idea it was initially. Come on. We all work in one direction. And I promised you guys, at the end, to show you the criteria, because everybody has a bad day, a bad week, a bad month, a bad project, or a bad company, yeah? So don't be quick to judge. Please wait to experience three or more symptoms on three or more different occasions, three or more different contexts. Once you see that highest certainty that you've got a charlatan in front of you, run, okay? Um, and then I promise you guys super quickly to wrap it up on a positive note. So luckily, I've got some great people along my career to learn from, yeah? And guess what's common in all of them? You ask them a question, they ask you back a question, not because they want to annoy you, no, because they need more insight, more context before they can come to a conclusion, make a recommendation, yeah? It's not to annoy you. They just need more context, more information. Then also, these guys are so well versed, as in this is my expertise from here on, guys, I don't know, but I know who we can get on board. Yeah, so they know how key collaboration is for our work. And what's amazing, these guys can talk about the drop-down while still considering the entire user journey, keeping it in mind. So they always consider that big picture. And last but not least, guys, so a bit, I'm a psychologist, what did you expect? So we're curious, very often, very analytical, we like to take things apart, and I, myself, very critical, like I would take things apart, Eastern European, maybe that's why. 
Um, then, guys, most of us are quite empathetic, oversensitive even. And if not, we are so well self-reflected that by that we can build cognitive empathy. Because we always check ourselves, our biases that we heard of yesterday. And guys, through the last, cry, the last three, four years, the corona, the war in Ukraine, I've come to realize we are uniquely equipped to deal with uncertainty. There is no one else who is more comfortable to deal with uncertainty than UX people. And last but not least, we are not some fucking unicorns, okay? Diakue Prague and Web Expo. 